Welcome back, Canonites. With Season 8 of the Master Chief Collection, we're getting something new and rather unprecedented when it comes to Halo. Armor sets that aren't canon to the main Halo universe. Instead, these armors exist in alternate timelines, separate from the main continuity. And today, we'll be diving headfirst into that alternate continuity. Now, if you want more detail on the real-world background of these armors and their inspirations, I covered all that in detail in a cannon fodder video, which goes more into how the idea of these armors came about. If you have seen that video, I hope you don't mind some minor repeat information as we re-examine the helmets while diving into the other armor pieces included with Season 8. As before, we'll be dividing the armors and extras into their three main themes, Medieval slash Fantasy, Norse, and Greco-Roman. We'll start, as before, with a look at the Greco-Roman-inspired armors. These armors come from a universe where a heavy Greco-Roman influence dominates not only humanity's aesthetic, but its culture as well. In particular, these armor pieces give us a glimpse at a powerful city-state of Lacedaemon, an older name for the land where ancient Sparta resided. In the real world, Lacedaemon was a mythological Greek figure. He married the daughter of the king of Laconia, becoming king and renaming the land after himself. He then built a city and named it after his wife, Sparta. Over time, Lacedaemon and Sparta basically became interchangeable terms for the area. In this alternate timeline, however, Lacedaemon has risen as a significant power, either surviving for millennia or reborn in a resurgence of Greco-Roman culture with a focus on ancient Sparta. To defend itself possibly from both alien invaders and other city-states, Lacedaemon has created the Chosen, their version of Spartan super soldiers, powerful warriors adorned in the finest armors and whose judgment is considered absolute. Like the Spartans we know, it would seem these Chosen have undergone harsh training after which their bodies are transfigured, recast into something more than human and ideal for eternal war. And in war, the Chosen are relentless, able to march for days without needing rest. They are typically outfitted with full bellows hoplite armor and warriors vambraces and greaves, though other armors exist, depending on what a chosen warrior needs and what they are worthy of. Shoulder pauldrons see the most variety short of helmets. Determined shoulder plate features leather straps, each with a story to tell. Glorious pauldrons and the Lion Guard mantle honor symbols of the past, the latter reimagining the old symbol to inspire new glory. And finally, we have the Valorous Spalders, blessed by Seers to turn a single fateful blow. The name of the chosen armor, Belos, is essentially a call to Zeus himself, a silent prayer to the sky god of ancient Greece. Superstition remains alive and well in the heart of Lacedaemon. Chosen will often work alongside mortal troops, which implies that the chosen are either immortal themselves or at least seen that way. This may be a twist on the Spartans Never Die trope of the main Halo universe. Chosen in charge of mortal troops will sometimes wear the Centrophos helmet and a Lakagos chest piece, not only to clearly denote their rank and role, but to serve as a symbol. Chosen are seen as akin to demigods. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if some compare themselves to Heracles or claim to be a descendant of him, and their judgment is absolute. Chosen commanders are often dispassionate and coldly logical, their recognizable armor a symbol of fear among the mortals they lead. Some Chosen don the Syntheno helmet, a symbol of their lost sense of self, these warriors having succumbed to bitterness never to walk the path of peace again. Others still abandon their sense of reason and reject assistance from others, often taking up Karata goring horns on their helmets for both symbolic and practical purposes. Despite these potential risks, it is also from the Chosen that the guards of the Chthonic Slipgates are selected, initiated into their mysteries and severing all mortal ties, binding vows and doubts. The nature of these slipgates remains unknown, but the name implies that faster-than-light travel as we know it is much harsher in this universe, more akin to a trip through the depths of Hades, Chthonic means of the underworld. This is appropriate given that these Chosen will often wear Kerberos helmets, named for the monstrous hound that guards the gates of the underworld. When deployed, Chosen are expected to return either carrying their shields or reposed upon them. The Bellos line is a very interesting universe, and interestingly, absent of references to the Covenant or Flood. They mention Lacedaemon's enemies, but we never learn who those enemies are. The Warriors' Vambraces suggest that other city-states exist alongside Lacedaemon, though specifics remain unknown. Are these city-states more like countries or world-controlling governance, or are we talking about city-states on roughly the same scale as ancient Greece? 
If the latter, might there be something like a council of representatives from the city-states that govern humanity? Or could it be that while technology has advanced, the dominance of city-states has resulted in a more fractured humanity, and thus one that perhaps doesn't spread as far among the stars? What lore we have suggests that while the Chosen are of Lacedaemon, they operate beyond its borders, whatever those might be. Demigods striding the land as warrior and judge. It's reminiscent of the ancient Arbiters in some way. If these had been the Spartans that the Covenant encountered, what might have been their reaction of the Sangheili? They grew to respect humans as warriors over the course of the war, but how would they feel about a human society already so steeped in the cult of war? That basically wraps up the Bellows lore, but before we move on, there are a handful of back accessories coming with Season 8, four for each theme. For Bellows, first we have the Lionheart Shield. The Guardians of Lacedaemon either return carrying their shields or reposed upon them. Second, we have the Tejetus Dori, a symbol of martial prowess. Tejetus is the name of a mountain range in Greece and the name of the highest peak in that range, Mount Tejetus. The mountains are named for the nymph Tegut, mother of future king Lacedaemon, though at least one myth has Tegut as the wife of Lacedaemon. Dori simply refers to a type of spear used by ancient Greek hoplites. Next, we have the Seafoam Trident. The arms of the Sea Lords are now prized heirlooms. So this is an obvious reference to Poseidon, god of the sea, along with the numerous sea nymphs and minor sea gods of Greek mythology. Finally, we have the Thessalian bow, a bow fit for the greatest of archers. Now, this seems to be a reference to Eurydice of Ihalia, a mythological king and skillful archer. Eurydice's bow is even said to be the same one later used by Odysseus, the bow that was supposedly so rigid that only Odysseus could string and shoot it. Now, I have to say, the name here is an odd choice. With so much of the lore dedicated to Lacedaemon and Sparta references, it's odd that they went with a Thessaly reference. Personally, I think making a reference to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt among other things, would have been a much better option. Artemis was even worshipped to a degree in Sparta, so it fits on a couple levels. But with that, we wrap up the Bellos lore. We next travel to the grimdark universe of the Blackguard, and I mean grimdark. The Blackguard universe reminds me a lot of Warhammer 40k, and for good reason, as you'll see. The universe of the Black Arts seems to be one where humanity spread across the stars, again more fractured and this time more zealous than the main Halo universe. And this seems to be the result of feudalism remaining a dominant part of human society well beyond what we typically think of as the Middle Ages, and not just for Europe either. As this fractured humanity spread across the stars, the center of power was the Solarian Core. Over time, the worlds of the Solarian Core came to see themselves as smarter and more enlightened than the peoples of the Outer Kingdom's worlds on the edges of colonized space. The Solarian Core, by the way, is a cool reference to the Soul Core, the original military and or governing body of humanity in pre-CE Halo lore. In that version of the lore, humanity had only colonized seven worlds and discovered four, air quotes, lost colonies by the time of their first encounter with the Covenant. Like the main Halo universe, this human empire eventually encountered the Covenant, referred to here as the Covenant Hordes, plural. That may not mean anything, but with the medieval theme of the Blackguard, I can't help but wonder if these Covenant are more like barbarian hordes. Perhaps in the distant past, the Covenant split into several factions, all sharing certain underlying beliefs, but with their own unique tenets and traditions. As a result, these hordes might be prone to more infighting, giving humanity a little more breathing room in their fight against them. But it's here that we can finally start talking about the Blackguard themselves. Once again meant as a Spartan analog, the Blackguard don't seem to share a singular origin like Spartans or the Chosen. Instead, Blackguard seems to be a blanket term for any number of groups that operate outside the laws of, presumably, the Solarian Core. In the main Halo universe, people from the Outer Colonies often accused the UEG and UNSC of abandoning them to the Covenant, and while there is a grain of truth to that, it sounds, at least to me, like the Solarian Corps actually did abandon its Outer Kingdoms when the Covenant arrived, damning the lords and worlds that had presumably been a pain in the Corps' side for some years. Left to fend for themselves, these colonies devolved into general lawlessness, no place for the weak or hopeful. The Blackguard are then the fallen lords, renegade princelings, and outcast knights of these worlds. And though they continue their own fights against the encroaching Covenant hordes, they turn equally to other means of survival, now that they have to fend for themselves. On the Kingdom of Verant, the Blackguard knights are renowned pirates and smugglers, greedily striking at their targets from a skyborne castle. 
I'm going to guess that this Skyborne Castle is a setting appropriate name for a type of starship. But hell, maybe these Blackguards of Varid have a full-on floating castle. That'd be crazy and awesome. I also wonder if they strike at both human and covenant targets, or if they have a preference for one or the other. Incidentally, Varent was the homeworld of Linda 058 in the main Halo universe. I'd love to imagine she still exists in the Blackguard timeline as one of the Blackguard pirates of Varent, perhaps keeping a watchful eye from above while her comrades are raiding on the ground. Next we have the Black Knights of Venezia, who I can't say are too far off from their Varentian cousins. Said to be as acquisitive and greedy as any jackal, these merchant thieves prowl the edges of the Covenant War, looking for vulnerable and unwary prey. In the main Halo universe, Venezia basically dropped out of the Human Covenant War midway through, becoming a rogue colony co-inhabited by former members of the Covenant and humans. A haven for pirates, smugglers, criminals, and exiles alike. However, unlike the mainline Venezia, the Blackguard of Venezia are capable allies against the Covenant, even if they're unpredictable as they are powerful. While no connection is confirmed, the Knight of Venezia Pauldron has a striking similarity to the Forsaken Dragon Helmet, which symbolizes not a fall from grace, but an awakening to reality. Again, I don't know if there's a direct connection with the Blackguard of Venezia, but it feels like it fits. The Venezian Blackguard do seem to have simply accepted the truth of their reality, rather than wallowing in their supposed fall from grace. On Alaria, it is said the Necrotex and Corpse Grinders labor over moldy tomes and strange ichors, hoping to uncover secrets that may be better left buried. In the main universe, Alaria was once a fertile world that entered a more than century-long drought due to instability with its star. By the Human Covenant War, the planet was a desert, the people left abandoned by the UEG. Alaria came to be ruled by numerous courier guilds, exploiting the people and competing with one another. In the Blackguard universe, it sounds like Alaria may have suffered a darker fate, what with the mentions of Necrotex and Corpse Grinders, but it seems to be home to old knowledge in some form. Perhaps a twisted version of Candlekeep from D&D or the Citadel from Game of Thrones. What the source of this knowledge is or its exact nature, we cannot say, but the secrets best left buried sound like they might be a reference to the Flood. There's no known connection between the Flood and Alaria, but that's just what this sounds like to me. We next come to Madrigal, home to siege masters and alchemists of peerless skill, though these fallen wardens are known equally for their cruelty. Though when it comes to fighting the Covenant, I doubt cruelty is much of an issue. It's interesting too that alchemy is still prominent in this universe, though it's likely not alchemy as we would recognize it. And now I'm imagining a Spartan using alchemy like in Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> But in all seriousness, none of the Blackguard lore mentions or even hints at augmentations like we see with Spartans or the Chosen. Either the Blackguard armor is entirely mechanical so that it can be worn by normal humans, or perhaps Blackguard are enhanced through alchemy of some kind. Perhaps Blackguard aren't too far off from Witchers. Finally, we have Tribute Keep. Of all the colonies we've talked about so far, this one might be the most interesting, at least in contrast to its mainline relative. In the main Halo universe, Tribute exists in the same system as Reach, making it an inner colony. However, the implication here is that Tribute is of the Outer Kingdoms, which is a pretty big change. Tribute is part of the Epsilon Eridani system, only 10.5 light years from Earth. Granted, Epsilon Indy, the system where the Outer Colony of Harvest is located, is only 12 light years from Earth and still considered an Outer Colony. Maybe we're seeing a similar situation with Tribute in the Blackguard timeline. Alternatively, maybe the Solarian Core is made up literally of just Earth and any colonies in the Sol system. Maybe there are no inner kingdoms, so to speak. Whatever the case is, it does seem like the Solarian Core largely abandoned the Outer Kingdoms to the Covenant Hordes, the Blackguard rising up in response to the existential threat. However, the Solarian Core isn't completely out of the fight, implied to be working with some of the former Lords and Knights of various Keeps and Kingdoms, perhaps providing finance and support for certain Blackguard groups. Still, the Blackguard cannot count entirely on the Solarian Corps, who outlaw certain arts and armors. They must seek out the best plate they can find, such as that crafted by the thrice-damned armorers of Far Isle Keep. These damned smiths will serve any who can pay their tithe of adamantium and bone. In the main Halo universe, Far Isle was, in a way, the birthplace of insurrection. An uprising in 2492 grew out of control, and in response, the UNSC nuked the colony, no one survived, and the incident only emboldened remaining insurrectionists. In the Blackguard universe, Far Isle has apparently been damned three times, though not wiped from the face of the galaxy. 
Or perhaps the Solarian Corps believes Far Isle was wiped out, only the Blackguard knowing better. The Blackguard come in a number of forms, as reflected in the variety of helmets and ideologies available to these warriors. The normal Blackguard helm is a representation of bitterness and pride frozen into iron. The faithful can adorn the tearful bishop, their newly found faith burning bright enough to consume any truth, a harsh contrast from the forsaken dragon helm that represents facing reality. The Blackguard are not virtuous knights though, those who don the carrion wind born to taste ill winds. Others don the sorrowful visage, honing fear itself to a sharpness keener than any blade. Finally, many fallen lords have found it better to rule from the shadows rather than serve in the light. This mindset is encompassed by the Ashen Crown. Though seemingly abandoned to alien hordes overrunning their worlds, the Blackguard lords and knights have, in many ways, flourished amid the destruction. Or at least, that's my interpretation of the available lore. Wrapping up things with the Blackguard armors, let's touch on the four new back accessories too. We start with Avalok's Lament, Ambition is your shield. Avalok was a Saracen king who converted to Christianity and was blinded by the Holy Grail for getting too close to it. In repentance, he has to live until he met the ninth descendant of his brother to give him his shield. This would seem to be Avalok's Lament. The shield eventually has a red cross painted on it in the blood of Josephes, son of Joseph of Arimathea, which restores Avalok's sight. And eventually Avalok hands the shield to Galahad, ninth descendant of his brother. The Avalox Lament Shield is modeled after Avalox Simple Heater Shield with an added legendary icon. Next we have Iron Burst, a pretty simple mace. This mace has shattered the bones of countless heroes and villains. After that we have the double-headed axe laws end, deeds will always trump words. And finally there's the massive longsword Sorrow Morn. Its blade is a thorn of malice. Black art is an interesting theme, much more style than substance but it's yet another I'd love to revisit. Wrapping up these new armors, we have the Norse theme of Drenger. Drenger is basically Old Norse for badass, a fitting title for the Norse-inspired warriors that make up our Spartan analogs, this time referred to as Skalds. The historic Skalds were Norse poets who comprised Skaldic poetry, one of two types of Norse poetry and distinct in its association with a single poet rather than tradition. Essentially, Skaldic poetry were original stories most of the time. The Skald Warriors of the Dringer timeline are storytellers as well, though for far more dire reasons. The universe of the Dringer is one of a Norse-dominant culture, and while we don't have many hints about the history of this universe, what we do know is that humanity encountered a dreadful threat among the stars, one the Skald are crafted to fight. Known only as the Shapeless Horrors, this seems to be another name for the Flood. The Flood were known as the Shaping Sickness to Ancient Humanity in the main Halo timeline, so Shapeless Horrors sounds like a play on that. The Shapeless Horrors strike at the body and mind, also vary in line with the Flood, so Drenga Rune Plate is crafted to harden the mind as much as protect the body. The Skalds realize that their fight will demand sacrifices of treasure and blood, but the clever Skald will find a way to avoid giving up their own. But as the name suggests, Skalds are not just warriors, or not warriors in the modern conception. Skalds rely on their sharp tongues as much as their keen minds. Skald lore spinners will travel the land collecting stories, their own and those of others, and relaying them to those who listen. From the great beasts of the world tree to costly tricks and jests, they fight to spark hope in the darkest of nights and spread tales as far and as fast as their strides can carry. Loss and sorrow are part of the journey but only act as fuel for these tellers of tales. For their deeds, many Skalds have earned the favor of doomed warriors and oath-marked kings. Skalds are no pushovers though, no law able to bind their word, no curse able to stay their tongues. Skalds are heard when they speak their words weapons as capable as any sword. The world of the Skald is even stranger, however, as dragons are known to roam the lands. Skalds will sometimes trade stories with these worms, some even making oaths of servitude to the dragons. These oaths are powerful, unbreakable even in death. Passion can become its own terror, however. Many Skalds adorn their rune plate with what they claim to be dragon teeth, though others claim the bones on their plate come from defeated shapeless horrors. Nevertheless, even when not speaking, Skalds are always telling stories, and their armor is often the ultimate tale. The Drenger timeline is easily the most interesting to me, though that's my bias for North mythology showing. The world of the Drenger seems to be one of constant fear. These societies seem to have some advanced technology, but they rely on stories being remembered and relayed by traveling warriors. 
However, this might be a holdover from Norse tradition, as although Norse culture had a fully developed writing system, they rarely wrote down their tales and beliefs. Before we move on to back accessories, I have to talk about the names of some of these armor pieces, as many are named after characters from Norse mythology. First we have Dvalin, a name belonging to one of the four stags of Yggdrasil, the World Tree, and a dwarf who introduced runes to the dwarfs. Skaldic poetry is also referred to as Dvalin's drink, as, according to myth, the mead of poetry, a drink that can make the drinker into a poet or scholar, was created by the dwarfs. Second is Nari, a son of Loki who was turned into a wolf, killed by his brother who was also turned into a wolf, and had his entrails used to bind Loki who had just pissed off the gods. Lesson here? Don't fuck with the Acer. Next we have Thera, named for a Danish queen, and Drenger in her own right, Thera. Though a queen, she is actually said to have led armies against Germans. After that we have Tyr, named for the Norse god of war and the man behind Tuesdays. And finally we have Valdemar, which isn't a character in Norse mythology, but essentially means famous ruler, likely a reference to Odin Allfather, king of the gods. Also quickly, there is the Vanir chess piece, which gets its name from the Old Norse word for friend, appropriate given its description. With those out of the way, let's tackle the back accessories. First we have Last Word, settling arguments one swing at a time. It's Mjolnir, it's Thor's hammer, but with a Sunghealy skull on it. Next we have Oak Limb, a simple oaken shield. One cannot throw a cruel barb without expecting some in return. Then we have Raven Oak, inspiration can be found in the strangest of places. And finally Reaver's Tooth, a tool of war and peace. This is obviously a God of War 2018 reference, the axe here is basically a mini leviathan axe with a halo logo. Reavers were also a class of enemy in that game. Before we wrap up, there's one last topic I want to address here, and that's whether these three distinct universes are in fact one and the same. There's nothing to explicitly suggest that the Chosen of Lacedaemon, the Blackguards on the outskirts of war and civilization, and the Scald lore spinners aren't all inhabiting the same universe. All three universes feature a fractured humanity spreading to the stars. Perhaps Lacedaemon is part of the Solarian core, perhaps Skalds travel to keep some tribute in Venezia to trade stories and fight the shapeless horrors, while the Blackguard fight Covenant hordes. However, I'm personally of the mind that these armors come from separate universes. I feel the worlds described by each armor theme are too different to work together, but that's my perception. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As I said when we got our first look at these armors, I'm excited to get my hands on them. The concept of Fracture's armor introduced in Halo Infinite already had me thrilled, and now we're basically getting a test run of this in MCC. I'm personally going to be rocking some of that Drenger gear as soon as I can. Thank you for watching, stick around for the Patreon shoutout, and until next time this has been Halo Cannon. First off, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Horospice patrons. First, there's Hope. Then we have Freight, Discombobulated Sycophant, Justin Montgomery, Ada Frame, Man in the Dark, Keisha Dila, Daddy Anarchy, and finally Great Scott Productions. Thank you all for your amazing support of the channel. Next, I'd like to thank our theoretical patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or get a direct shout out, check out patreon.com slash halocanon. You can simply support the channel or get additional benefits, such as behind the scenes materials, including raw audio for upcoming videos, or even shout outs like this. All patrons now get early access to certain videos as well, and more benefits are to come. However, your continued viewership is more than enough for me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, and maybe even subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. If you really enjoy this, turn on that notification bell so you can be among the first to see new videos when they release. But for all my fellow Canaanites, keep on being awesome.